Hello, I'm Zach Adam from the University of Arizona, and today we'll be talking about huge chemical complexity and constraining the chemistry to form life. So when we look back into the deep past, we run into some really interesting challenges regarding how life could have originated from a non-living environment. When we look out into the stars or and we look at these exoplanets orbiting other stars and all the moons in our solar system and all the asteroids and nebulae and everything else that's out there, the majority of matter in our universe is not alive. And as far as we can tell so far, only the matter that's on our planet that makes up organisms uh, is alive. So bridging these two states of matter is a very, very big challenge and the subject of origins of life study. And so today we're just gonna go into a small sampling of an example to show exactly how difficult it is and why it's difficult to bridge these kind of two states of matter. Now, when you learned chemistry, uh, if you've learned chemistry yet, uh, or if you learned it like I did uh, a million years ago, uh, you learn it in this kind of stick and ball model. There are atoms which represent the balls and they're linked together through chemical bonds to other atoms to form molecules, much as you see in this image. When you dig deeper into what makes up atoms and molecules, you realize that these atoms are not simple balls at all, and they're not these simple kind of stick connections to everything around them. When you dig into the structure of an atom, there's actually many layers of substructure, including uh, some the, the outer electrons that tend to form those bonds and everything underneath. And so what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna step through those different object levels and see how tough it really is to come up with any particular compound in a natural environment where you've got everything interacting with everything else. So let's start with kind of a canonical type of molecule, uh, a molecule that's kind of like the holy grail for origins of life research, uh, or at least the theory of origins of life research, the RNA polymer. And that's kind of depicted in this uh, long stringy uh, series of beads that you see at the top of the image. And now we're not gonna dive into how complicated it is to actually get this string of beads put together, uh, but let's just zoom in on one of these, one bead of this kind of polymer, uh, and look at what makes it up. And when we realize, when we zoom in on that one molecule, itself is made up of three different molecules linked together. And, okay, this is already a very complicated molecule as it is. Um, but you can imagine that if you were to have this number of atoms linked together to form these molecules and bonded together in this particular pattern, if you were to switch out any one of these atoms, you might change the entire molecular behavior of the molecule. It might not even function as an RNA nucleotide if you were to make that substitution. Or if you were just to keep this exact same number of atoms and you were to link it together in a slightly different way, it might not behave like it at all. So you have to get not only the exact correct atoms in the correct location, you have to get them linked together in exactly this way, otherwise you're in trouble town. So let's zoom in on that. Let's just take one molecule, the adenine molecule that you just saw on that previous molecule and zoom in on there. So we saw that last picture, but we realize when we zoom in here that the same thing applies. When you zoom in on this kind of sub-molecule of that larger molecule, if you were to switch out any of these, for example, nitrogens or hydrogens or carbons with any other atom, it wouldn't be adenine anymore. It would be something else. And when you zoom in even closer and you start to consider how atoms interact with each other and uh, how they interact with whatever liquid they might be sitting in, um, it's a completely different story. So we just step through from starting with an RNA polymer, a bunch of molecules linked together. We zoomed in on a single nucleotide, then we zoomed in on a component of that nucleotide, and we're used to thinking of them when we look at chemical reactions or when we look at these pictures of molecules, we think they're kind of floating by themselves in space and they're not really interacting with anything else. But when we put it in liquid, it's interacting with everything around it. And it's kind of in the way it's depicted in this image, you can think about the atoms being linked to each other to form molecules, but at the same time, they're having all of these very complicated interactions with all of the molecules that it's floating in at the same time. And each of these molecules might be pulling in different directions, or they might be causing some strain on the molecule. And you have to really uh, mitigate all of these interactions to come up with a molecule that's going to 
function the way that it needs to in, in, in terms of a, a, a biomolecular structure. And if you're thinking about um, trying to generate these molecules from scratch, you have to contend with this very complex array of interactions and effects. And there's really no way to get, to get rid of any of those effects. And then oftentimes you want to use those effects to conduct your chemical synthesis reactions. So it's really complicated. We've, we've shown that. Uh, and there are a number of different ways that origins of life uh, researchers try to navigate this complexity and to create experiments that help us get to the root of how life could have originated from a non-living state. And I'm going to summarize a couple of different categories, and these are by no means mutually exclusive. Many times they're kind of mixes and matches of each other. Uh, so one particular kind of strategy in terms of constraining the chemistry of the origin of life is to constrain the location. Usually we can look at a location that exists on the Earth today and imagine that it might be a similar type of location in the deep past. And we can design our experiments by comparison or analogy with these modern environments. But a lot of times it's really difficult to imagine that you're getting a pure set of reactants in this, in this kind of environment. Because if you've been to a lake or a pond or a river or the ocean or just a, a surface rocky environment, there are a lot of things, uh, a lot of different compounds, and a lot of different sources of energy around to mix and match. So getting a pure ensemble of what you need to conduct your origins chemistry is very unlikely. Uh, on the flip side, you can go completely to the lab and never go outside, and you can only constrain the reactants so that you can really narrow down the types of reactions and the types of molecules that you need in the needed amounts to get the biomolecular compounds that are of interest to you. And the resulting disadvantage is that you're not likely to create a network that's very complex or robust. It doesn't really reflect much of a natural environment. And a, a final kind of strategy is just to constrain the energy source. And it's kind of between these two, um, these two kinds of other examples. And you're really just looking at what kinds of types of energy are needed to drive your reactions of interest. So maybe you don't need a pure set of reactants or maybe you aren't tied to any particular type of environment to design your experiments. Um, and you're just looking at the effect of driving energy into the system and watching compounds come out. And a disadvantage of this approach is that, as you saw, we've stepped through multiple levels of objects that make up uh, a complex molecule, all the way down to the level of, of the nucleus of an atom and outwards to these giant macromolecular structures. Uh, so it can be very difficult to predict what's going to happen when you're crossing so many thresholds where the rules change every time you move up a, a kind of object level in size. And so with that, uh, I'll close here. Uh, there are many different areas or keywords that you can use to investigate uh, these ideas more for yourself. And uh, I've listed a number of, of top level references that are kind of the most up to date and cover some of these various examples of constraining complexity in studying the origins of life. Thank you.